everybody. Jackie Woodside here, founder of the Conscious Living Summit and the Curriculum for Conscious Living. I'm so glad that you've been following along with these interviews. And today I am so excited to bring not only a dear colleague and an extraordinary spiritual teacher to the platform, but a dear friend of mine, Dr. Reverend Temple Hayes. Dr. Hayes, Dr. Reverend Temple Hayes is the uh, founder of one of the largest unity churches on the East Coast down in Florida, and also the founder of the Institute for Integrative Leadership. I, what is that, Elaine? It's a, it's a long it's thing. It's long. It's, so help it's, me out it's here. Like you, it's almost like if you can say what it is, you, you get a certification. Yeah, it's just the, for being able to the, say the name. It's yeah. the Institute for Leadership and Lifelong Learning International, thus yeah. tagged ILLI, I-L-L-L-I dot org. <laughs> Awesome. It's well, welcome. Sometimes Temple. I trip on it and I, I created it. <laughs> and you created it. So awesome. So it's so great to have you here with us today, Temple. Thank you so much for your generosity and, and spending this time with us at the Conscious Living Summit. You know, I'd, I'd love to just begin today. You have such an amazing history and story that has led you, you know, to, to being one of the, the world renowned spiritual teachers and thought leaders about conscious living, which of course is why I wanted you to be here with us today. But I know it, you didn't exactly pop out conscious, awake and aware that you, you've done your time and you've had quite a journey getting here. Do you mind just saying a little bit about your process uh, that has led you to where you are as a, a, a oh, yes. minister and teacher? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would say that um, one of my quotes is united we stand and divided we are merely a distraction. And that has been a quote that I felt, you know, was gifted to me in my heart and my soul to continue to grow into that. And that's when I look at external things like government, school systems, uh, new thought it, it can use a lot of help in that regard. Yeah. You know, is that united we stand, but divided we're merely a distraction. I live well, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. What do you mean we're merely a distraction? Well, I'm going to elaborate on okay, it. Okay, good. Uh, the, so in that, what I mean by that is the deeper part of that sacred reality is that it wasn't just about what I was seeing externally. It was what I was experiencing internally. So in other words, instead of saying we have a current pandemic, let's all put ourselves together together. Let's put our heads together. Let's put our hearts together. Let's see how this can work out. We divide. Oh, you're staying home. Oh, you're going out. Oh, you're getting the shot and you're not. We divide. We're, we're actually trained early on in our lives from the beginning of school or religiosity. You're either good or you're bad. You can't be both. And you're either a color or you're not a color or you're gay or you're straight or you're smart or you're not. We have a lot of division that we are kind of programmed to, to feel that divide. When we are divided, we're merely a distraction. In other words, we're not a laser focused idea or expression of God, whether it's in management or whether it's managing your own life. So for me, the divide was growing up and early on being outdoors under the tree at five years old and hearing God say to me, you, are here for, I don't know what God said, I was five. Was it a difference? Was it you have a work? Was it feel the wind blow temple? And yet I would then go to the Baptist church. I would hear, I was a sinner, uh, very little hope for me altogether. And then you incorporate discovering my, so in my spirituality, I was definitely divided in the culture, in the culture. And I would speak things and people would go, what are you like a prophet? You're weird. You're, you're, you're just weird. And then when I discover that sexually I'm different, well, put it over the top, would you? Oh my God. I thought these people in this small town are going to put me in a straight jacket and they're going to admit me. And it really did. It really was Jackie going that way for a period of time that I did go and I had a homosexual assessment. I'm 13 and a half. My grandmother, whom I adored, said to me, you know, I'm so sorry, I won't see you in heaven. I have a granddaughter who's going to hell. So yes, I was distracted. 
because I no longer, I did not feel loved. I did not feel embraced and all of that. So my life, I have been perfectly primed, if you will, because of those things. And I think that is what often is in the way of people living consciously. They think because of those things, I can't be. Because of what happened in my childhood, I won't be. Because of what the teacher said, it, it won't unfold. My, I'm the opposite. I am because of those things you will be. Because of what happened, you shall be. Because of what your experiences were, as harder as you fell is as high as you're going to fly. And I, I don't just say that. I'm not trying to sell a book. I don't have a book yeah, yeah. that says as hard as you fell is as big as you're going to fly. I really believe that. Right. And that That's was beautiful. the conscious shift. I needed inside myself so I wouldn't be divided. And so I wouldn't be a distraction because I was a sacred wounded healer. Most people that are old soul, like you and me, which means that not only are we aware that we have been around many, many lifetimes, we're conscious of it. So in that awareness of being an old soul, it's, it's often more difficult than a person that can say, I'm, I'm born in this life and I want to learn how to just play golf and I'm as good as my golf game. You know, that they may have the right idea, but to me it's, oh no, I need to be about the world and supporting people and, you know. All and I love that. what you're saying, Temple, because I want, to, I want to just pull out something that you're saying here is that a lot of people would say, well, I had all of these experiences, therefore I can't. And you're mm -hmm. saying, I had all these experiences. That is why I can. That is why I will. And fundamentally, what you're saying is be careful to not believe every, be careful to pay attention to what you believe or what you are creating. Right. Your know, beliefs aren't like truth. They're just what we've interpreted from the yes. experiences that we've had in life. And we mold those into a set of beliefs that then creates how we interact with life. And I, I mean, it's really interesting to me that you were able to do that at such a young age, because what I see in most people in my many years as a psychotherapist and as a coach is that people have these, if you will, difficult or negative experiences. They turn those into, if you will, difficult or negative beliefs that they then have to recover from. It sounds to me like the way you just described it, that you skipped a phase. You skipped the phase of creating non-supportive, low vibe beliefs. And you just took those experiences and said, this is why I can, I will transcend, create what I want, be strong. Am I? Well, the, <laughs> lots of therapy later in shamanism. I, I, I would say that, you know, the shamanic path, which essentially means wholeness and infinity. And um, so I would say that because of things, the deeper core of me that I kept drawing into is that I am a byproduct of nature and therefore I cannot be a mistake. I'm not saying that there weren't times I didn't feel like, how did I get to be this mistake? But I certainly had a deeper core going on that that's the reason I didn't kill myself because I had lots of car accidents. I mean, I was one of the best drinkers I had ever met in my life. I didn't say I did it well, but I drank a lot for 15 years. So that era, let's don't talk about conscious living. <laughs> Because every, me every message from the age of 14 to 29 that I got that says, stop doing this. Well, I just didn't listen. So that being said, um, I would say that um, there is a, it, it's, it's tough being original. And I believe because even spiritual leaders, a lot of them that I listen to, they, they say, oh, you know, you just have to be original. And then people feel so inadequate. Uh, oh, very original. Because no one ever says, no one said it's easy to be original. So I'm going to give that to you right there. Don't start tagging me that I'm in la-la land. Right. Let me tell you, being original every day of your life, no one said that it has to be easy. Now, here's the thing. I didn't say it will be hard. It will be hard. If you aren't that, it will be hard if you don't listen. But we're definitely a culture that 
we get off on ourselves by saying, oh, be original, platitudes, cliches, put bumper stickers on our car. Being original in the midst of breaking news, constant teaching to program us, constant imagery to tell us that we are inadequate, we need to be afraid, the shark is coming. Um, did you know that since 1900, Jackie, and all of you tuning in, since 1900, okay, there have been 824 shark bites in the state of Florida. However, did you know that when you see it in the news and you see this picture of this big shark, you would think it happens every week. We have children visiting here with their family and they go, please uh, don't take me anywhere where the shark are. People, I won't go into the beach because of the shark since 1900. And that's what news, who's driven to sell, people forget that, who's driven to make money, who's in alignment with all the pharmaceuticals now, it's programming. And it has never stopped since the 1800s. What's being printed, what's being told to us is this much of the truth. Those of us that are multidimensional and those of us that are like you, it's like we, we must learn to articulate to people. Maybe we make it look easy because we wear blush and, you know, and, and, and there is a spirit within us that is doing the works. But to be original and have people ask you your opinion when you don't believe the three stories on international news and you don't buy into it, yeah, it takes chutzpah. Isn't that what we would say? It takes chutzpah. And I think that's why people feel like they, they kind of grasp what we're saying because you know they see us in the smiling part and everything. And the joy is real. The joy is real. But somebody said to me the other day, um, I saw you speak at Carnegie Hall. And I've seen a lot of speakers. And I was so happy when I saw you because you're joyful. And I've never seen somebody so joyful. And how are you so joyful? And I said, well, uh, joy uh, to me is an acronym. Just open yourself joy. So when I am a space in my life, when my personality is going through whatever it's going through, when I'm concerned about family members and New Orleans because of a hurricane or whatever, it's just open myself. So it's just open yourself. So it's keep my heart open. Stay in tune. Listen, listen, don't get caught up in the flash, the notifications. But what is what are my internal notifications? And then the difference is people negate joy often because they go, well, I'm going through a tough time. Well, you don't understand. Uh, my cat just died yesterday. So did mine. Well, you don't understand. Uh, my husband is drinking a lot. Well, you don't understand. And I go, I do understand joy. It, again, it's not dividing. Oh, if I choose joy, then that means I'm negating being sad. Oh, if I choose joy, that's not real. It's like, no, joy is the capacity to hold bliss joy and grief simultaneously. That is so brilliant. So you're, you're saying laughing, you're laughing on one side yeah. and you're crying on the other and that is raw joy because you cannot be, a, in my opinion, a conscious, living, vibrant level of God and not feel the capacity of joy and grief at the same time. And that's so misunderstood by people <laughs> teaching it because it's like, you're, you're, we've been divided. You're either good, you're bad, it's black, it's dark, it's sad, it's this, it's sad, it's that. Yeah, I think you're getting at something that, that is very misunderstood. And that is the complexity of being able to <clears throat> experience 
perhaps contradictory emotions and, and yes. thoughts and experiences at the same time. But really, that's the gift of being a human being. That yes. is conscious living, that the background of who I am, uh, you know, just open yourself. I love that joy of just open yourself. <clears throat> the truth of who we are as spiritual beings having a human experience is that we were born in joy. We are here to experience and express love uh, through yes. joy. And yes, in that container of life, there will be anger, there will be frustration, there will be angst, there will, there will be grief. You'll have the full rainbow. You'll, you'll experience the full rainbow of, of humanity, but it's in this background of being conscious that we are spiritual beings experiencing humanity. So that's, that's a brilliant distinction. Oh, well, thank you. Well, you know, when I, before I met my shaman teacher when I was 38, I mean, I was about, you know, enlightenment, enlightenment, and, you know, in that, and the path, and I was about, let's just focus on the fun stuff, because I had not had an easy go of it, and I've, I've already shared that, but it, when I then was exposed to shamanism, then I started honoring that if you don't own your feelings, they own you. And, and then the deeper part, and, and that's what you kind of said in the beginning, you know, conscious living isn't, you know, I learned this in 12th grade and I'm still doing the same thing. Uh, conscious living is whatever I say I am, whatever I say I am, I am congruent. Now, I, a fun example, it's like I'm vegan. I mean, and have been for many years, not because of trends, not because of that's what gay people do. Nothing like that. Just I just got the message that that was what I was to do. And so I've been doing it and I did it for a day and then I did it for a week. And just like, you know, drinking, I stopped doing it. Finally, I wanted to not die. And, right. you know, I'm 34 years next month. And so, oh. you know, I stopped and I'm vegan. But yeah. yet every now and then being in the South and filled with all these sayings and you, you hear yourself saying and go, Oh my God, who said that? So I would say, Oh good. That's a wonderful project. That way we can kill two birds with one stone. I went, wait a minute. I don't kill birds. I don't ever want to use that saying again in my life. I don't ever want to say that again in my life. Scratch that. So that to me is the beauty of what you're doing. And the work and how you are clarifying it and having it right in people's face because you can be, uh, I call it the difference between being certified and being dignified. Certified is you have taken what someone else has taught you and you're doing what they taught you and the way they told you how to do it. Dignified is the development of your own originality while measuring your own congruency at the same time, having the core foundation of who you are spiritually, but yet allowing the evolution of everything that you are about your tools. You know, it's just like you, you can have a flip phone. I think that would be a good example that's coming to me. You can have a flip phone. I have several friends that still have the flip phone and there's nothing wrong with that. However, all the new downloads, all the new voice record, all the new fancy little memes and funny little things, they don't get to be part of that, right? Because they don't have the system that goes with that. They don't have the applications. They don't have the applications. So we have people in New Thought that, and I know this because they tell me, and they get so excited that we don't believe that prayer is begging and pleading and making honoring and agreements and all that. So we're, we're so happy about ourselves because we know that prayer is invoking, declaring, calling in and all that. But why would we stop there? You know, why would we stop there as we evolve? So it's like the new prayer for me is that prayer is not even asking anymore. It's 
when I pray, what I'm doing is I'm saying to the creator, I got your signal. And I'm telling you that I'm a yes. Yes. I want to ask you about that temple. You said something a few minutes ago about, uh, about when you just, you know, I'm vegan because I got that message. I got a message. Okay. And, I, you know, because we're friends, I've heard you use that phrase several times. And, and I think in our, uh, you know, in our circles, people who are committed to conscious living, we use that phrase a lot. I, I got the message or I had an intuitive hit or I just had an, an inner knowing. And yet I really want to pull that apart a little bit. You know, what does that look like for you when you, quote, get a message? Mm -hmm. Is it an internal experience? Is it an external experience? Like, what is it? Is it a feeling? Uh, is it something that you hear in prayer? I just really want to deepen that because, again, part of my motivation here is we have all of these phrases and concepts that we use right. inside of our circles that I really think deserve you know, more airtime or more uh discernment and i want to bring that forward you especially oh, you with bet. you you bet yeah, yeah. Uh, so so let's just go to something people understand uh very effectively let's say gps let let's say gps or navigating system in your automobile and let's just keep it simple in that way that you put an address of where you want to be and then based upon that you listen to you're going to turn left up here going to turn right well some people argue with gps i've been in a car with people that actually argue in a town they've never been in and they'll go that doesn't feel right and i go well aren't you gonna aren't you at least gonna believe in what the satellite is telling you oh it just doesn't feel right you know whatever but it's this controlling thing so it's like and then they'll pass the road and the gps says you really need to turn around you really need to turn around well the gps our God personalized system that I wrote about years ago in my book is, is likened to that. It's the God personalized system. And so that being said, it's when I say I get a message, it's not the voice. I heard somebody say not long ago, and I wish I knew who it was because I'd give them credit. When you hear the voice that's critical, that's not the voice. That's your personality. Good luck with that. It'll get you in a whole lot of trouble. It's almost like hell on earth. When you hear an inner, you don't really want that. You really want that. Oh, go left. That's your intuitive faculty. And it's like a muscle. It's like being in a workout training. It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the more you develop it. And at first it feels hurtful, just like a muscle, like, God, I had no idea that coats really worked me out. Kind of hurts because you're in a level of trust that more than likely most people have never been before. So you have to develop the muscle and then it doesn't matter what anyone says or tells you or their opinion or what the news says, you're really gonna listen to that. The other thing is, that I look for signs and wonders. So if I've got something on my heart, I didn't say my head, on my heart, a feather, I'll find a feather, uh, I'll, a bird will come. I mean, there's signs that give me indications. The other thing that I live by and have for many years, when I release my stubbornness, <laughs> and my rebelliousness, and I realized that, oh, this creator kind of does a whole lot more than I do. Let's just surrender to that. So wait, hold on. I'm just going to, I'm going to challenge you. How do you release your stubbornness okay. or your rebelliousness? So Let's one, keep, keep one of the things that I look for is for something to knock on my door three times. So just like becoming vegan, I ran into somebody that says, I, and I go, God, you seem to be, you know, really happy. Yeah, you know, oh yeah, I am because I changed my program. Oh, tell me about it. So it happens three times. Well, you know, releasing your, your stubbornness is that your whole life review, you don't have to wait till you die to see the film. Everything that you see in your life is there because you've made an agreement for it to be there. Now, 
we can go very esoteric and deeply metaphysical and say that you attracted everything. Well, I'm not going to say that consciously that we even know that we have attracted everything. I'm going to simply say that no matter whether you attracted it or you did not, or you consciously chose it or you did not, because your soul that we've just made as a soul that this isn't your first rodeo, your soul may have chosen that which you see in front of you, but regardless of how it got there, you get to be in agreement or out of agreement that it's going to stay, right? And so when you're looking at certain things that have patterns in your life, for example, someone being critical of you, uh, how does this keep happening? You know, 12 people later through 20 years. Hello, it's because you are that. Because if you do not, if you're not critical with yourself, you wouldn't tolerate for a year, two years, or for a 45-year marriage, anyone ever criticizing you. You wouldn't tolerate it. So to release the stubbornness is about the determination of a simple thing that you and I didn't make it up, Jackie, but if you want different, you got to do different. You want different, you got to allow. And I always coach people, give something a month because people are so quick to argue their limitations. They don't want it, but yet say, well, you can let it go. Oh no, I, I can't let it go. I've got savior complexities for God's sakes. You know, I, I can't let it go. And, you know, it's like I, I ran into this woman this weekend. I, I led a shamanic retreat for the weekend. And there was this woman there, oh, just a beautiful spirit. Her whole life journey is taking and fixing in the illusion of that, taking care of everyone. And so she's approaching me and she's telling me that. And, and she thinks that I'm going to, you know, just validate and everything. And I said, um, I look at her and I go, you are doing them a terrible disservice. And she's like, what? I said, people that believe that someone else is going to save them are not given the opportunity to discover their own independence. Absolutely. And innately, that's who we are. Innately, the eagle pushes baby out of the nest and doesn't say, well, I'm going to stay right here. I'll be with you every step of the way. So I said, eventually, those people that you think you're their white horse, they're not only not ever going to grow into the understanding of their own light and dark and life path, they're going to resent you if they don't already. Mm -hmm. If they don't already. So um, I'm talking about people that are capable, for goodness sakes. I'm not talking about people that have health challenge, mental challenge and things where we mm -hmm. offer a level of caretaking or better yet, caregiving. Sure. Um, and there's that distinction of that. But that's a different talk for a different day, which I would love to have with you. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that caretaking versus caregiving is in me inside of my listening, a distinction in conscious living. Mm -hmm. you know, it is caretakers is something you do out of kind of duty and obligation well i've got to do this because and and caregiving is something that you do consciously from the heart because it's aligned with who you are and and what you value therefore it's something that you give i, I mean that's just off the top of my head but uh there's, you, another, you know, there's another part of that please yeah please when you are caretaking you are allowing the event the moment, the person to take your energy. When you are caregiving and you are congruent with what you're doing in a way of purpose, it gives you energy. And that's a huge distinction because people don't often understand in the, in the wounded healer and the sacredness of that, that 
the opportunity to serve is profound. And if it's clear, it energizes us. If it's not clear, it makes us a martyr. Well, you don't understand. I, I, I don't really have a choice. I'm just, I'm doing the best. So a care, the difference is I am a lighthouse always intentionally. I, I, I always is a big old word. Okay. But I am a lighthouse, a lighthouse, the, as the boats get rockier, the light gets brighter, right? The lighthouse doesn't say, oh, let me dim your lights um, so you'll feel more comfortable in your rocky boat. The lighthouse doesn't lean over and go, let me join the rocky boats. And it took me a while to get that because, you know, um, when something phenomenal was happening in my life and I'd call a girlfriend and, uh, you know, she'd answer the phone and it's like, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm not having really a good week. Well, what's going on with you? Ah, oh, just same old, same old. And I'd be holding on to like some, you know, great, beautiful story and I wouldn't share it. And I, I, I stopped that because I realized that I was joining the Rocky Boats and um, it was important to share a, a wonderful, hopeful uh, evolution story of, you know, something great happening. And um it's important. And we as human beings, we forget that we maintain our energy, but we don't produce it. It comes from spirit. And, and there's always more than we can ever use. And I think that's part of, you know, conscious living is that that's an area that we don't talk enough about. I mean, you have great scholars out there teaching everything is energy, but it shocks me how few people have it. <laughs> right? So let's right. talk about that a little bit. I, I love what you said there that you don't produce your energy, you sustain it. Um, yeah. So we sustain the energy that's produced by spirit. Yeah. And as you said, a lot, you know, everything is energy is something that you hear a lot today. And a lot of people are yeah. teaching. Let's dive into that. And, you know, your understanding of what it means and why it's important for us who are committed to conscious living. Absolutely. Well, energy is all oh, energy is everywhere. It's always available. It's, it's always available to us. And it's about not being driven to run our lives by our personality. And that's why in the oldest of any master teacher, all master teachers say, it's, it's really not me, but it is something within me who doeth this. And I'm just a catalyst. I'm just a flow. I'm just allowing. And it goes back to what we talked about in the very beginning. If I'm divided, if I'm divided, it divides my energy. So one thing is that we do not have energy rations. We don't get energy on Sunday and then it's up to us to be careful and make sure that by Wednesday, we're not worn out. Yeah. And, you know, Richard Carlson taught this of how you know, he'd be on a plane with people on Monday and I've, I've had it happen. I'm on a plane with people on Monday. This is before the mass era. And they would be talking about how they're going to be tired by Friday. And here it is Monday. <laughs> how do you know you're going to be tired by Monday when, I mean, by Friday when it, you're still in Monday? And I, I got that. And that became a real practice for me to do the big can of shut up. I don't affirm What's going to make me tired? I don't want to firm. I don't, if I use the word tired, my wife goes, what? What's going on? Because, um, because of that. Because yeah. every day is a brand new day. I've gone weeks with the sick animals, sitting up with them at night. And no one would ever know a narrative with me that temple's worn out. Because I believe that I'm drawing from something greater than myself. On the other hand... It's common sense. We, we don't want to release common sense. So common sense is having not had sugar as best as I can control it as far as what restaurants serve. I mean, I haven't had sugar in I, I, more than 20 years, I guess. But if I had sugar, yeah, I'd be tired. So that's what I say that there are decisions that I make 
that give me more energy, like fresh juicing and things like that, or getting rest, uh, common sense things. But the producer of energy is my allowing it to flow, not rationing it, not affirming all the time how much I have or don't have. And the biggest thing is to me compartmentalizing. Oh, so oh well, oh well, when I'm over at the office, I'm I'm working more. And when I'm home, it's more quiet and I have more energy, not compartmentalizing. Wherever I go, I am spirit, immersed in law, living according to the moment. I'm choosing what I'm giving my energy to. I'm choosing how I want to embrace that. And I just always have enough. Yeah. And I I always do. And it's not fake. It's a development. It's a process. And it's a style, right? And it just takes shifting again, the being original, because you're not taught that you need the pill, you need the drug, you need the super thing after 40, just to keep you going. Right. And, right. And, and you don't. It, it, well, you know, you know, I love one of the things you said too, about, you know, sustaining energy. And you said it so casually that, you know, I, I just love how much this is not just what you teach, but it's who you are. And what you said so casually is just, I'm not run, I'm not lived, not given by my personality or by my yeah. ego. I recognize that my, my energy comes from the spirit within me. And that little phrase that's a universe in wisdom, I'm not lived by my personality. Yes. Huge. Mm-hmm. That I mean to me is, and I love, I didn't know that you don't eat sugar, by the way. We have to talk about that sometime. <laughs> um, you know, and then, right, but all of those practices that you talked about outside of that, resting and not eating sugar and knowing that there doesn't matter if you're at work or at home, that your source of energy is consistent. It's not like you have a battery pack at work or, you know, oh, yeah. at home or something. Oh, yeah. right. But that piece, I'm not lived by my personality. I'm not run by my personality. Can you unpack that a little bit more and say more about that? Yeah, because I'm, I'm just so aware of how limiting the personality is. Right. And right. Um, it has, it has a lot of challenges, bless its heart. And so it's, it's just being aware and, um, And that's what conscious living is. It's not like one time and you got this certificate and you were there the weekend and then you're all set. It's every day. It's every day being aware. So if I'm going through some kind of change, well, let me give you an example that that brings it home. It's not really fair to the men, but it's the one that's coming through me. So I'm going to say it. When I was coming up on menopause, you know, too long of a pause between men, and so I was bombarded with media, you know, research, friends older than me, and that it just starts. And they start telling me that, oh, it's going to be hard. And what was it like for your mom? And it was hard for her, not hard, that it won't be hard for you. And just data, 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 data unfounded opinions, UFOs, unfounded opinions. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. So I start being in that space and my personality is going, oh, well, this could actually be a reason that, you know, things aren't easy for me right now. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. Wait a minute. Well, what if I were a cave woman right now and I didn't have access to this information at all? Well, what did they do? Okay, they didn't do all this. They didn't take all these bills. They didn't go get all this stuff. They just said, here we go. This is part of my ordained, natural, gifted by God cycle. Well, do I believe that God makes everything hard? No. Okay, then why am I buying into this? So then I will say GPS. I'm setting a trail. I'm putting in my future address. Mine will not be difficult. It won't be difficult. So what happens after that is I have somebody come into my life that's older than I were talking one day. She said, you know what? Easiest thing I've ever done. I went, I'm not living by my personality nor anybody else's. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be easy. Um, let it be. And then we skip the beat. 
I've never had a thing. I've never taken a supplement for it. I've never done anything. I never even noticed it other than the obvious. All the other classes we could have about that. Right, right. It was the breeze. It was a breeze. And we're programmed. And we have got to get off the, we put so much faith into data and not the data of who we are and the brilliance that we are. We are mighty beyond measure. Yeah. And we have got to get, we have to understand, follow the money. And I'm not talking about being abundant. When we're bombarded with this data, it's so we'll buy a product, so we'll spin, so we'll be ordinary. And um, you just start to really listen to that. Yeah, so, so great. You know, one of the other things that I'm passionate about, as I know you are as well, is this notion of, of elevating consciousness on the planet. And I know you have a commitment to that, a passion to that, as many teachers do. And still, one of the things that I'm interested in and that kind of vexes me is what do we mean when we're talking about consciousness? And I've asked that question to you know, pretty much every speaker on the Conscious Living Summit and have gotten a variety of, of definitions for that which I think is, it, it's just really interesting that here we are, you know, in this kind of, uh, in this phase of conscious evolution and conscious awakening. And yet there's still this kind of amorphous notion of what consciousness is. So I'd love to hear you weigh in on that temple. How do you understand consciousness itself? Well, you know, I have, um, it was certainly the most simplistic answer. It's about being awake, paying attention, and it's every day. Every day, my questions are, how am I living and how am I dying? And I you know, wrote a book about that. I'm not saying that to sell the book, but it's how am I living and how am I dying? What's giving me life and what's depleting my life? And that's a constant, and how did I do that? I have yet to exceed Howard Thurman's quote, if I ever do, I'm going to go, oh, Howard, I hope you like mine. His quote is, do not be, paraphrasing, do not be concerned about what the world needs. What, What the world really needs is for you to be alive. Focus on that. That's what the world needs is for people to be more alive. That's what the world needs. Yeah. I, and that's when you are conscious, you are living in an energy that says I'm living, I'm awake. It's a brand new day. I can take yesterday's experiences. I can repeat them. I can keep bringing them in or I can be open to what do I want to take? Every day is like packing luggage, Right. packing your little backpack. Am I going to carry this today or am I going to let it go? Am I going to tote it? Am I going to keep making it matter? Am I going to tell all my friends same stuff, same day? How am I going to do that? That's the part, you know, that we are in that conscious life. And uh, the simplistic common sense is to always remember when you blame, you don't claim. And that's why I tell people, if you're over 30, please, for God's sakes, quit blaming your parents. Right. We get it. We wasn't easy for you. Wasn't easy for a lot of us. But as long as you're blaming something, it's depleting energy and not giving it to you. You have to accept your responsibility of how it continues to live in your life. And that's Beautiful. that's kind of it for me in the in the nutshell. But thank you so much, Temple, for your your wisdom, the, the teaching that you brought forth today, extraordinary, so many nuggets for people to take out of it, to elevate their experience of you know, going within, being energized, knowing that life isn't happening to them, but for them and oh, good. Forward, conscious living. So I know lots of people are going to be interested in finding you and following you. I know your Sunday services are streamed because I often watch them. So tell people a little bit about where to connect with you and go deeper with you and what you're up to. Thank you. Well, the easiest way is just my name, Temple Hayes, uh, templehayes.com and um, or on Amazon. I'm there. So yeah, you just look me up. And And what's the name of your ministry in Florida? 
It's the First Unity Spiritual Campus. First Unity Spiritual Campus. Great. Yeah. First Thank Unity you. Spiritual Campus. And we're on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And I like everyone. We're on social media. Of so. course. You guys create wonderful Sunday experiences. I, I really thank enjoy you. watching them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so, so thank you so much, Temple, for your love, your wisdom, your generosity. It's wonderful to be here and have you with us at the Conscious Living Summit. See you soon. Thank you, my dear. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you.